Hello turtles, good afternoon. Uh, it is Johnny. It is, um, well, this lesson is to be August the 16th of 2020, and I hope you guys are doing wonderfully. We are in the uh, Gospel Project book with the big old freaky eyeball on the cover, um, and we're, we're getting toward the end of this book, and I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to getting done with it, because just frankly, between you and me, this cover freaks me out. I don't really like it. Anyway, we are in um, Unit 24, Session 1, um, where Jesus cast out the demons, and we're going to be talking about Luke 8, um, starting in verse 26. So if you want to start looking that up, and then we'll... Uh, actually, what we're doing here, um, Jesus cast out demons, is last week's lesson, but it's really good. Um, and we were doing the send-off, uh, Nick was doing the send-off of the um, members of our class that were going back to school last week, so he did a different lesson. But frankly, I thought this one was too good to pass up. So what we're going to do is um, sort of mash up two lessons together today. Uh, so we'll be moving quickly. We'll be doing um, Jesus Cast Out Demons and Jesus Feeds a Multitude. So we'll be hitting both of those um, uh, we'll be hitting them sort of lightly, not going quite as deep as the uh, book goes into their uh, into the detail, but we'll be hitting them both. So uh, start looking up um, Luke 8, 26 for a start, and let's start out in prayer. Holy Father God, Lord, we love you. Thank you for letting us be with you today. Thank you for your church and your community, your uh, community of saints that meet and and uh, enjoy fellowship and worship you and learn about you and draw, draw closer to you. Lord God, that is our, our goal, to draw closer to you, to be more like you, to learn more about you and, and learn to love you more every day. Father, we ask for your help in that area. Draw us into you, Father. Help us to be more like you. And Lord, for myself, I pray that you would speak your words through my mouth today draw us all closer to you and help us learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome back. Um, and for the ones that are watching from your renewed spot in college, welcome back to school. Uh, we hope it's going well. Okay. So let's get going here. Uh, Jesus casts out demons. This is a good one. This is a, it's a fun lesson. Um, and by fun, I mean that it's just, it's, it's uh, incredible to watch Jesus do the things that Jesus did. Um, so we'll start out, uh, as soon as I get on the right page here, we'll start out with uh, Luke 8 and 26. Then they sailed to the re region of Gerases, I guess that is, which is opposite Galilee. When he got out on land, a demon-possessed man from the town met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes and did not stay in a house, but in the tombs. Ooh. Um, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said in a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though it was, uh, though uh, he was guarded, bound by chains and shackles, he would snap the restraints and be driven by the demon into deserted places. What is your name? Jesus asked him, asking the demon. Legion, he said, because we are many. And they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs, and he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Okay, so this is um, a story on demonology, of course, because the, the man was possessed by, by demons, plural. Okay, um, to be uh, demon-possessed, uh, a lot of the time they, they run in herds. They tend to uh, travel in, in packs. Um, and before we get too deep into this, I'll tell you straight up, you start talking about supernatural stuff, demons and, and angels and things. And, um, a lot of people, 
a lot of people in today's American society will look at you like you got three heads. So um, it's, I am absolutely convinced this stuff is real. It, it exists. And um, there was a, a story I heard one time about a missionary who had been to uh, some faraway country doing missionary work. And he said, if you don't believe spiritual warfare is real, if you don't believe the devil is real, start working against him. He will prove himself. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's spooky. And in today's society, yes, absolutely. People will look at you like you're nuts. Um, that's, that's just a fact. But I also believe it, it is a fact that this stuff is real and it is becoming more real every day. Um, as we get closer to the end times, these things are starting to kick up their heels. Um, it, it's starting to be more real all the time. So uh, as we study about it, um, there's a few things to keep in mind here. First off, Jesus, uh, as we've said before, Jesus had a hard time getting people in his culture to recognize who he was. That was probably his main problem during his time spent on earth was uh, getting people to recognize and believe that he was the Messiah, that uh, there had been a lot of pretenders come along. There's been a lot of pretenders since then, too. But there's there were a lot of pretenders claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be somebody, and you know, they were all just crackpots and were treated as such. And Jesus got treated as a crackpot a lot himself. The difference was he was the real deal, but he still had a big problem getting people, especially the deeply religious people, to acknowledge who he was, to recognize him. Who did recognize him, though? We've talked about this. It's been a while, but we've talked about this before. Who consistently immediately right now recognized who Jesus was the demons did the people that were demon possessed or demon oppressed um, immediately recognized that Jesus was the son of the almighty he was the incarnate God that was here on planet earth and they went nuts oh man the the demons speaking through the people that they were riding as a parasite on, um, the, the demons went nuts. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that the earth was kind of their domain. They were used to having their own way here. They were not used to uh, someone that was that close to God and that powerful um, showing up in their turf. Okay. Um, so, uh, that that was it was um, it was new it was different and it was terribly uncomfortable for the demons to have a, uh, a an incarnate figure of God Almighty in the turf that they had been running for a long time. Okay, it's still that way. Uh, so um, that was that was new that was different. They were not used to it. Okay, another thing. Uh, Jesus asked, uh, he didn't do this, um, uh, I should have looked this up, but I think this is the only time that Jesus asked the demon, what is your name? Who are you? Okay, and the demon answered back, Legion, because we are, my name is Legion, because we are many, all right? This guy was, had a belly full of demons, oh, it was, uh, he, he, might have had hundreds or thousands of different demons that were taking up space in his physical body. Um, and let's back up just for a second. Why was it, do you think, that the demons all recognized Jesus? Okay, the only thing I can come up with is that demons are supernatural. They are uh, not naturally of this world. They exist in the spirit realm. They can manifest in the physical, but they exist in the spirit realm. And uh, God exists in the spirit realm as well. So they recognize somebody from their dimension, so to speak. Okay, um, And they immediately, just immediately recognized it. People had a hard time with it. The, the spirit beings recognized it immediately. Okay, And then here's the main thing. Who is afraid of whom? 
Jesus walked off the boat onto this piece of land where this crazy man was uh, uh, running around. He lived in grave uh, graveyards in the mausoleum. He would he would you know crawl into the tombs with the dead uh, decomposed corpses and live there. They had tried to bind him up. Dude had supernatural strength. They would wrap him in chains. He would just like in the comic books. He would rip those chains off just like they weren't even there had total supernatural strength um he was um he would cut himself he was you know he was a, a cutter as we call it now um he he was a mess the guy was a total mess and but when jesus showed up oh okay so this guy was a mess and he had he had totally freaked out all the people in the in the neighborhood if he if somebody saw him he would run at him. Here's this wild-eyed, naked man running at him. The people would run the other way, okay? Um, and that had happened over and over and over again. Jesus walked off the boat. He thought, oh, cool, fresh meat. And here's somebody else to scare. And he comes running up. Was Jesus intimidated or afraid of this wild-eyed, totally insane, naked man running toward him? No, not at all. Jesus watched him come, and as the guy got closer and recognized who Jesus was, who became afraid of whom? The demon-possessed man became terrified of Jesus. All right, that's a huge thing to keep in mind because that's the way it's supposed to be. If we are not um, owned and operated by the Lord Jesus, you have every right to be terrified by supernatural uh, demon-possessed things or people. Uh, you are right to be terrified. You should be. Run fast, run far. Um, you, you, that's a correct response. But if we have the Lord Jesus in our hearts, if we are owned and operated by the Lord Jesus, if, the, if Father God is our, is our owner and operator, um, if we are living our lives for Jesus, then that flips. Tables are totally turned. Um, the demons need to be afraid of us. Okay. And what did he say? Um, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. Okay. That's it. Tur it turned into terror. And this guy was used to being the terrorizer, not the terrorized, okay? Um, he, was, uh, he wasn't used to this stuff, and all of a sudden he saw somebody that was infinitely more powerful than he was and um, knew everything that this uh, possessed man had done. Um, another thing to keep in mind here, Jesus took great care of the person uh, of the human that was being oppressed and possessed uh, by the demons. He took great care of the human being, but he had no mercy whatsoever. Well, actually he did. He had a little bit of mercy on the demons themselves. He, rather than sending them to hell, which is what they were afraid of, Jesus allowed them to go from this man where they had been living as a parasite or as a bunch of parasites. He allowed them to go into a... Um, into a uh, herd of pigs that was over there on the on the hillside these demons all fled out of the man and they inhabited these pigs and then they did what demons do the scripture says that the the devil comes to steal kill and destroy and they went into the pigs and they destroyed they stole their lives they destroyed the pigs and what they did was they um, forced the pigs to go crazy and they ran off a cliff out into the sea and they were all lost. So just like a parasite in our, in our bodies, um, parasites don't make any sense if you think about it. They feed on us, but when we die, they die. You know, it's, uh, it, it's a, uh, being a parasite is a self-destructive um thing and these people destroyed their host just like they were in the process of destroying this man uh, they had destroyed their host um, and but
but the man was clean. The man then all of a sudden, within a short period of time, he had found clothes to put on. He was in his right mind. He was just as sane as could be. And he was sitting at the feet of Jesus and giving thanks. Um, the, the point that is not usually brought up, though, is that if we are Jesus's people, the demons need to be afraid of us. Um, and I'll, I'll just read it out of the book here. To see this man in action would cause fear and revulsion in us. To witness him running toward us and screaming would send us running away in terror. But as much as he would have been afraid of the demon-possessed man, the demon-possessed man was even more afraid of Jesus. It's kind of like a snake. And it just depends on your, your personal makeup, what you think of snakes. But um, I've always heard that if you encounter a snake, the snake's more afraid of you than you are of it. I'm not sure that's always true. <laughs> okay. I think uh, that can be at best an even match uh, is who is more afraid of whom. But um, this demon-possessed man was terrified of Jesus. Um, and the demon-possessed man, it says here, lived in constant shame. These are kind of hallmarks of, of things that are um, consistent with demon possession. The demon-possessed man lived in constant shame, marked by his nakedness. In those days, to be naked, well, kind of like now, to be naked in public was a, a terribly shameful thing. He lived in constant shame, marked by his nakedness. He lived in isolation among the dead rather than the living. In other words, he he um, pulled into he he uh, pulled into himself. He withdrew from from uh, civilization. And he had supernatural strength to break all restraints. He couldn't be kept safe even from himself. Uh, a while back, we also talked about there's two things with demon um, occupation in your physical body or in your spirit. And that is that um, there's two, two levels, so to speak. There's demon oppression, and then much worse is when there's demon possession. And the best way I've ever heard it put is that demon oppression is like if you're driving a car and you pick up a hitchhiker that is the demon okay the demon's in the in the passenger side but he's suggesting things to you hey take a right here oh man you just passed a cop you better floor it you know that sort of thing he's he's making these terribly bad suggestions into your into your mind um and those suggestions are always meant to harm you or to do you harm um, so that's bad enough is to have somebody whispering in your ear all these things about you ought to do this or, you know what you need to do you know you deserve this and, and those those kind of suggestions um, the much worse and fortunately less frequent thing is demon possession and that is when the demon slides over, throws you out of the driver's seat, and now the demon's driving the car, and you're along for the ride. Uh, that is not good. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's some bad stuff. In other words, you have lost control of yourself. You have lost control of your will. You've lost control of your functions, and the uh, demon is driving. You are a passenger in your own body at that time. Um, that's nightmarish. That's that's horrible. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that the demons, um, in to a large degree, in some way that you may not even realize consciously, you have to give the demons permission. You have to allow them in, and this can be in ways that seem so innocent. Um, for example, if you've ever messed around with a Ouija board, okay, calling up the spirits or whatever, that is opening the door. It's like if you had a door into your soul, that's just throwing the door wide open saying, come on in, okay? The Ouija board is no joke. It's a toy, but it's not a toy, all right? Um, other ways are through pornography. Um, that's just, again, opening the door for this evil influence to to enter you um, sexual abuse um, uh, 
can be an, an entry point for demonic activity uh, if you've been molested or raped or, or that sort of thing. Um, and I've done a fair amount of reading on this stuff. It's um, uh, even things like consulting uh, an astrologer or get, having your fortune read, tarot cards, that sort of thing. All of these things are entry points. It's, it's you giving permission for these occultic things to enter you, all right? So um, be very, very careful of that. Better yet, just don't do that stuff. And if you have, if you already have done that sort of thing, if any of these things I've mentioned or anything along that line, you sort of get the idea of where we were going. Uh, anything along that line, if you've been involved in that or if you've been a victim of any of this sort of thing, renounce it. Um, go before God, recognize what may have happened to you, and renounce it. Ask God to cast it out of you. Um, and the same power that uh, Jesus showed over these demons is available to you. Um, oh, another thing is if you've ever messed around with voodoo or witchcraft, uh, that is a total uh, permission. Okay, and most people, the reason they get involved in voodoo, witchcraft, that sort of thing, um, the occult, is because they desire power and they um, are too naive or not understanding of the fact of where this power comes from. It comes from the wrong side, all right? It's, um, yeah, the power is real, but it comes from the wrong source. The, we need to be getting our power from Jesus from God and not from the devil. It's just that simple. All right. There's a book that, uh, one of the books that I've read on this subject is uh, this one, They Shall Expel Demons by Derek Prince. Um, Mr. Uh, Pastor Prince was a fairly um, well-known preacher back uh, some years ago. I forget how long ago he lived, but um, it's a really in interesting book. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're at all like me, after having read this book or, or one like it, you'll be seeing devils behind every tree. <laughs> you'll, you'll probably be seeing more devils than there actually are out there. So just a word of, of caution on that is um, some things just happen. They're not demonically uh, uh, caused, but a lot of things are. Uh, and one of the things that I think is demonically inspired are these uh, crimes that you hear about on the news. Um, you know, there's there's murders, there's violence, there's all of this. But then the, every once in a while you hear about stuff that is just beyond beyond the normal horror of, of uh, uh, physical violence or murder. Um, it just goes beyond. And your thought when you hear these stories are, how did they even think of doing that? What is in them that made them even consider doing such a thing? And I think that's where the demon inspiration comes from. Um, they can they can put some absolutely wild ideas in your head, okay? Um, like this guy that was living in the tombs with with uh, the corpses. Uh, you know, that's, that's weird. That is seriously odd. So, um, that was it. So spent too much time on that. Anyway, um, so then uh, let's continue here with Luke 38 uh, and 34. Um, when the men who tended the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported it in the town and the countryside. The people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the demons had departed from the man. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They had been afraid of the demons, but now they were afraid of Jesus as well. Meanwhile, the eyewitnesses reported to them how the demon-possessed man was delivered. Then all the people of the Gerasen region asked him to leave them, asked Jesus to leave them, because they were gripped by great fear. So getting into the boat, he left. Um, they, like I say, they had been terrified of this man, but now they were terrified of what had of the power that had converted him as well. It's um, just a, a, a strange thing. It's amazing what we can get comfortable with. It's amazing the evil that we can 
grow comfortable with if we've experienced it for long enough. Um, this man had been healed by the, the son of God himself. And that terrified these locals more than the, than the man had in the first place. Um, the other thing Jesus did that didn't go over so big was that he had destroyed somebody's uh, herd of pigs, their, their livelihood, basically. Um, so that didn't go over. But more than that, uh, that was sort of the, the tangible uh, financial part of it. Um, but more than that, they were afraid of the power that Jesus possessed, even though that power would have helped them enormously. Um, and there's a thing in the book here that said uh, Jesus had just liberated a demon possessed man. What more could he have done for them had they on uh, what more could he have done for them if they had only believed? But since they had fear without faith, they rejected the miracle worker in their midst. It seems they preferred their own slavery to sin and Satan over submission to the Savior. That Guys, it still happens today all the time. It, it is, I won't say normal because I don't want to give it that kind of power, but it's its not unusual at all. You offer somebody whose life is a flaming hole in the ground. Um, they have crashed their lives. They are in terrible trouble. And you offer them Jesus. And you, you explain to them how Jesus has in the past healed people who were exactly in their position and they reject it just out of hand totally reject it right now and it happens all the time that it would be like um, if you had terminal cancer and you weren't long for this world and somebody says I can do a, a very minor surgery on you that won't hurt a bit and this cancer will be gone, but they've already gotten used to the idea of dying and they send you away. It, it's, it's crazy, but it happens all the time. Excuse me. Um, and it's important for us to realize that if you um, encounter somebody who is in desperate need of Jesus's help and you share Jesus with them, you tell them what's going on. And this is what Jesus can do for you. And this is how he does it. And he did it for me and it worked. I've changed. I'm this different person now. And you tell them that and they look at you again, like you have three heads and they say, eh, no, thanks. I'm good. And they walk off. That will happen. It's happened to me. It'll happen to you. And it's really important. Um, and this might be a person that you love dearly, somebody in your own family. Um, it is important to recognize what Jesus did when these people ask him to leave. Did he go, no, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry about the pigs. Okay. We'll work on the pigs. I can fix the pigs, but let me explain to you what I did. No, Jesus didn't do that. They asked him to leave. All right. Jumped in the boat. Off he went. There is not a case anywhere in the Bible in which um, uh, an example was given where Jesus was rejected by somebody that he chased that person down. He never did it. The rich young ruler said he went away grieved when Jesus said, uh, when the, this guy was sort of arrogant, he came up and he said to Jesus that I've done all these things. I've kept all the commandments. I've tithed, <clears throat> excuse me, I've done my tithes and sacrifices. I've done my penance. I've done all these things that I'm supposed to do. What else? And it's kind of like, what else you got? What else can I do? And Jesus said, there's one thing you like. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. And then come follow me. And the guy couldn't do it. And it's not that Jesus was against him having possessions. It was that the possessions had him. All right. Um, this guy was his uh, identity, his, his security, his everything was wrapped up in his great possessions. And when Jesus said, no, that's not where it's at. What you need is me. So get rid of all that stuff. Just get rid of it and come follow me and you'll be all right. And the guy couldn't do it. It really didn't even sound like he gave it serious consideration. He just, 
He couldn't do it. And it said he walked away grieved. Now, did Jesus follow him? Did Jesus chase him down and say, let me explain to you why I'm asking you these things? Nope. No, he didn't. Jesus did not chase anybody down and tackle them, trying to get them to listen to reason. Okay. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind about this particular uh, occurrence is when the man is what happened to the man afterward. He, uh, the demons were gone. He was clean. He was saved. And he was sitting, he was dressed, cleaned up, combed his hair, all that stuff. Um, and he was sitting at Jesus' feet just worshiping because he had been basically in hell. And Jesus had saved him just like that. And um, that's us, guys. That's us when, uh, reading this out of the book, when a person places their faith in Jesus, that person undergoes a fundamental change of identity, just like this demon-possessed man did. Whether you got a belly full of demons like he did, or whether it's just that Jesus saves you from your own natural inclinations, okay? Uh, we become a new person, and we have a new identity. We have a new family, all right? Um, rather than being a part of the family of this world that's doing all the insane things that this world does, it seems like especially right now, um, rather than being part of that family, Jesus adopts us into his family. Come on in. Come on. Get out of the cold. Come on in here. And you are adopted. You are an heir to the family of God. It just, it does not get any better than that. Your identity has changed. Your, your, um, your soul has changed. Your spirit has changed. Okay. And your soul is your thoughts, your beliefs, your, your preconceived notions. Um, it's sort of your, your thought life. Okay. It's, um, it's your identity. Um, it's who you think you are and that sort of thing. And that, um, your spirit changes as soon as you allow Jesus to, as soon as you submit yourself to Jesus and allow Jesus to take the reins and, and uh, uh, take you know, Jesus take the wheel, so to speak. Um, your spirit is saved at that point. It takes a while for the soul and the physical body to catch up. All right. And that part is, is still left up to you to a large extent. Um, the, Soul is your emotions, your thoughts, okay? And uh, that you have to work on. It, it takes some time. But your fundamental identity has changed, and your, your soul and your flesh will come along after a while. Um, and there's something else that we'll talk about to do with that in just a minute. Now I'm moving on to the second um, lesson here where Jesus feeds the multitude. And this we'll skip over to John chapter 6, starting in verse 26. All right, so flip over to John. And um, we're, we're kind of bouncing around the, the miracles that Jesus did here. Um, so they, uh, I'll give you a second to get there, John 6, 4. Or better yet, put me on pause for a second while you get there. Uh, in your... And your small books is on page 104. Okay, so John 6, 4. And now the Passover, the Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread for all these people so they can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread, that's like six months' wages, wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a bite. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, here's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Okay, so that's the verse uh, for, for this moment. Uh, the men numbered about 5,000. Presumably a lot of them had their families with them. So there may have been 10, 15, even 20,000 people there sit on the, seated on this big hillside. Okay. Um, Jesus knew something about people. 
And I heard this, I've been looking all over the place, trying to find where this came from, and I don't know how to give it credit, but it's, it's not an original thought. But um, Jesus knew that um, it doesn't do a lot of good to try to feed people's souls when their bellies are empty, okay? If you're in physical need, you, you have some physical need that needs to be filled, and um, you try to talk to people about spiritual stuff, the physical is going to win every time. Whoops, there's my phone. The physical is going to win every time. Okay, um, so don't try to feed people's souls if their if their bellies are empty. Um, so Jesus took the initiative to meet the people's need, but he did something really interesting. He could have just said, "Boom, you're fed." Okay, and either the people instantly would have been been satisfied of their hunger, or the um, like the the when the devil was picking on Jesus and tempting him, he said, "Turn these rocks into bread." Jesus could have done that. He absolutely could have said, "Look at your left foot, and right beside your left foot, here's a, enough bread to feed your family." Um, he could have done that, but he didn't. What he did was he asked his disciples, "What you going to do? You got all these people coming." Uh, how are you going to handle this? What are you going to do? Just to see what they were, how they would go. And who was it? Philip said, oh man, if we had six months wages, we couldn't give all of them a bite uh, with, with all these people. He's thinking in the physical, right? He's thinking like we all think. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, Jesus, uh, like I say, took the initiative to take care of their physical needs. And he didn't discount their physical needs. He didn't say, I got this amazing spiritual lesson for you. You really need to hear it. So don't worry about the food. We'll figure the food out later. No, he took care of it. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see here. Okay. So, um, we are often the means through which God works and answers prayers. Okay. A lot of the time the Lord will allow us to see if we can uh, handle a problem through him. Um, let's see here. God certainly moves in mysterious ways, but he often provides for his people through his people as they love their neighbors. This could involve meeting needs by giving money or buying groceries for someone in need, but it could also be helping to rebuild a home after a hurricane or helping a single parent by babysitting the kids. Okay, sometimes, uh, frequently, um, the Lord asks us to, to jump in and help. And um, as Pastor Mark said um, at the uh, men's conference, it's, it's an old saying, but it's true, is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And he said that the... Um, one of the best ways to get people to to pay attention to you when you start trying to share Jesus with them is to have a relationship with them first. Um, jump in there to fill a need. Um, do something to help them out, and uh, if the and but don't force Jesus on them until they get to know you a little bit, until they trust you and know what you're about. Especially if you're. Um, going to have to confront them about something that you know is bad, wrong in their lives. Um, have a relationship with them first. Let them, let them know that you care, okay, before they care how much you know. Um, okay, so the next thing is the point two here. Jesus provides super abundantly for the needs of people. Okay, so we're going in verse 11 now. Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were full, okay, there were five barley loaves. And, you know, we think of a big loaf of bunny bread, right? It's like so long. Um, somewhere I read that uh, that probably was not the case. These loaves that he's talking about, the five loaves, were probably more like a biscuit. Um so just five little little hunks of bread and a couple of little fish. And the fish may have not even been entire fish, but more like a, 
almost like a spread, just like a fish flavoring, just to give the, the bread some kind of flavor. Um, so it was not much. This was this was a, a, a little boy's lunch <laughs> for the afternoon. Um, it's like, you know, your little bag at, at school. Um, and I'm reading here, the boy's lunch was paltry at best. Barley was what the poor used to make their bread. Um, oh, okay. This is where it said it's, uh, they were probably more the size of biscuits. And Jesus took, uh, Jesus did the impossible. He took this little tiny meal and multiplied it into a fantastic feast. And if you can envision, these guys had a little, little basket or whatever, and they started going around and people would reach in and they'd grab a thing of bread and they'd grab a fish. The next person would grab a thing of bread, grab a fish, next one. And it happened over and over and over. And whatever the little container was, it never went empty. And, um, and then there's a, a little inset here in your book, The Voices from the Church. Jesus demonstrated power over the physical realm to point us to his power over the spiritual realm. Every, physical, every visible miracle Jesus performed during his earthly ministry was a whisper. They pointed to the most dumbfounding miracle of all, that the display of his power to transform the human heart from stone to flesh. Um, all these miracles that he did were not, um, were not for show. They were, they were pointers. They were saying, I can do this but I can do a whole lot more, okay? And uh, it's, um, that, that's it. And, and the thing is, this happens over and over in the Bible. Um, and there's a thing here that says, the Bible is full of stories in which God takes little things and makes much of them through his power. Gideon routed the massive Midianite army with just 300 guys. That's in Judges uh, 7. David, the youngest shepherd boy, just little guy, early teenager maybe, defeated the skilled warrior giant Goliath. That's in 1 Samuel 17. In the book of Acts, these get bigger as it goes along. In the book of Acts, the ragtag group of Jesus' disciples became a multiplying movement, carrying the gospel across the known world. Um, just amazing what he can do. Um, and let's define a miracle here real quick. A miracle is an event in which God makes an exception to the natural order of things or supersedes natural laws for the purpose of demonstrating his glory and or validating his message. Um, it's when God jumps in and says, this isn't, uh, this is how things normally work, but watch this. Okay. Um, and sort of the, the, the take home from, from this particular event is that um, Jesus showed them all, including his disciples, that he has the power to provide abundantly, just as he came to give life abundantly. And in John 10.10, 10, it says, I came to give them life and to give it more abundantly. God is a God of abundance. So much of what we're hearing right now in the, the, the climate that we're in right now is that we're running out of stuff. There's not enough to go around. There's a lack. Um, we're, we're running out the world's resources, the planet's resources. There's not going to be enough food. There's not going to be enough water. Um, the, 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 the planet's uh, changing and it's overheating and all, earth, all life is going to cease to exist in just a little short while. It's, it's all this um, panic mongering, it, it's all about lack and not enough. And what are we going to do when? And God is the exact opposite of that. God is a God of abundance. He's a God that provides so much we have no place to put it. There was a thing that we saw, I just thought of this, but there was a thing that we've been watching. Uh, it's kind of past now, but um, it's up in the... Um, uh, some national park in Alaska, I can't, Katamai maybe or something, I may not have pronounced that right, but it's a park up in Alaska with a, a waterfall and some rapids on it, and it's where the salmon swim up to, um, they leave the ocean, swim up into the river to spawn and, and 
and finish out their lives. And there are these um, not very big waterfalls, maybe five feet, and the uh, salmon have to swim upstream. So they're jumping out of the water up these waterfalls. And they do it by the insane numbers. They do it by the tens of thousands and millions, whatever it is, but it's a bunch of fish. And you can actually see the water moving as these schools of fish are, are going through the shallows. Well, the brown bears up there figured it out too. And these bears come and they sit on the falls and they wait for a fish to jump into their mouth. Okay. <laughs> they obviously don't know the price of salmon. If you've checked that in the supermarket lately. Wow. Um, for us to have salmon, it costs. For them to have salmon, it's sit there in the water and catch one as it comes by. And then they amble over to the side and eat the fish. Except they don't. The fish are so plentiful. And these bears, by the way, they're fattening up. They're, they're putting on their fat stores prior to hibernation. So this is a late summer thing. They're fattening up for the winter, right? So they have to eat. They have to eat hard. They got to eat enough to get them through this long Alaskan winter. So these bears, they catch the fish, they go over and you would think they would eat it down to, you know, eat the fins, eat everything else, eat the head and eat it down to the last morsel. They do not. These bears, that was the thing that was so amazing to me. There is such abundance. These bears catch a fish, they go over, they bite a chomp off of it, uh, might bite the head off of it, or they'll get a bite or two, and then they just let it float on down the river. So this barely eaten fish, maybe a tenth of the fish is eaten just enough to kill it, um, goes over the falls and on down the river. Now, somebody else will eat it as it goes along. There are seagulls float, uh, you know, circling around. There's coyotes and wolves. There's different things. So I imagine it gets eaten before it's over with. But the point of that I'm getting to is the fish are so incredibly plentiful the bears feel no obligation to finish what they started. And God is the God of that kind of abundance, more than you can imagine. And um, in Ephesians 3 and 20, it said, God is able to do more than we can ever imagine, ask, or think. I didn't word that exactly right, but it's a pretty good paraphrase. Um, God is able to do more than we can imagine more than we dare to ask, think, or believe. God is a God of super abundance. Um, so to provide a little bit of a boy's sack lunch to feed 5,000 people, for Jesus that was just having a little fun, I do believe. He was taking care of a need, and the need was real. But for Jesus it was just like, hey boys, watch this. You know, um, It was really cool. So then... Um, then Jesus gets to the point of, after the people are full, okay, got the full belly. Now, what you want to talk about? And talk fast before we die, before we go to sleep. <laughs> if you've ever taught a class and see people right after lunch, that's tough, man. Trying to keep them engaged uh, right after lunch is a hard thing. Um, but Jesus had the, the me message for them then. He said, okay, now you're full. Let's talk about what matters. He said, I just fed you. Cool. That's good, but you're going to be hungry again in just a matter of hours. You're going to be hungry again. What you just ate that filled you and satisfied you, I'm that for your whole life. I'm that for your whole eternity. I am that satisfaction. I'm that filling of a void. I am, I am the, the filler of your need for the rest of your life and for all eternity. Listen to me, people. You didn't come here, well, you did, you came here for dinner and a show, right? You came here to, to get fed and to see a miracle. You came for dinner and a show, but I'm not that. If you will take me, if you will believe me, if you will feed on me for, you know, uh, as an uh, as a illustration, if you will feed on what I have to offer, you will be filled from now on. You'll never... You'll, you'll never be alone again. You'll never feel like you're the only one in the world. You'll never feel that hopelessness. You'll never feel that emptiness. I feel it. I satisfy it. And in your flesh, you know, we're, we're all here on earth. We think in the flesh all the time. The flesh only wants one thing, more. Your flesh 
your desires, whether it's food, whether it's drink, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's sex, pornography, power, whether it's whatever your weakness is, okay, whatever the weakness of your flesh is, the weakness of your flesh only wants more. Back up the truck. Come on. Um, your flesh only wants more. But, and, and Jesus was talking about physical hunger because these people were hungry. Okay. But we would today more call it emptiness. If you've come to a point in your life where maybe all your dreams are coming true and things are going great and you go, eh, okay. What and what I expected it would be. There's still an emptiness there. That's what Jesus comes to feel. And we talked about it a few weeks ago that, um, uh, just went blank on his name. Anyway, a uh, songwriter said there was a God shaped hole in my soul that I tried to fill with drugs and people. Um, Paul Williams. Um, and, and we all have that. And that's what Jesus came to feel. And the other thing uh, that Jesus said to these people that had just eaten physically, and he was trying to convince them that I am the bread of life. Okay. I'm the guy that feels you. Uh, don't fall into the trap, very easy trap to fall into. Don't fall into the trap of putting more value on the gift than you do the giver. Okay. Um, if Jesus answers a prayer of yours um, and some great wish of your life comes true, uh, don't focus too much on his answering of your prayer. Okay. Focus on the one that answered it. All right. So don't uh, focus on the focus on God, not the gifts that he gives. OK, so that's that's it. So um, we are out of time. But aren't those two great lessons? Oh, man, the the in one kicking out the demons, getting rid of things that are in you that don't need to be in you. And then and then the, in the other filling you with something that you do need. OK. And uh, and if if. Jesus does um, kick a, a demon for, you know, even if you think of it figuratively, if he kicks a demon out of your life, be careful to uh, immediately ask that that space be filled by the Holy Spirit because demons tend to come back. Uh, and if there is an empty space there, they'll jump right in. And the scripture says they'll go get seven of their buddies that are worse than them and you'll be better off at, or you'll be worse off at the end than you were at the beginning. So when Jesus cleans something out of your life that needs to be cleaned out, uh, make sure that you fill that void with the Holy Spirit. And that's just a matter of asking, fill me, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. So that if that thing tries to come back into your life, it will. Um, when that thing, when that thing tries to come back into your life again, make sure that the Holy Spirit has filled you to the point that it has no place to settle. Okay. It has no place to go. All right. Um, so that's it for today. Thank you for coming. We love you. Welcome back to school. Do well. Uh, remember who you work for. Remember what your job is and study hard and do well. The world needs you. We love you. Let's finish in prayer. here. Holy Father, God, thank you for these lessons. Thank you for Jesus being our prototype, being the template of what a human being is supposed to be like. Lord, thank you for the power that you give us through the Lord Jesus. And Father, um, let you be the source of our power, not some witch down the street. Let you be the source of our power so that the power that we show into this world is the power of Christ, the light of Christ, uh, just as we're supposed to do. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for caring about us and wanting us to be your children and um, draw us in closer to you every day. In Jesus' holy name, we pray these things. Amen. All right, everybody, we love you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.